There are now over 1,000 uh, papers written about sonography of the cervix, and this is a very hot topic in uh, the um, literature. Um, while uh, 15 years ago, when I began to study uh, cervical sonography, uh, we were kind of the pioneers in this field, now pretty much every unit in the U.S. and abroad is doing a transvaginal ultrasound of the cervix, which can be done many different ways, as you can see from this 4D uh, real-time display. Again, I want to thank everybody um, at Thomas Jefferson University, especially in the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine, uh, for their support as the data that I will show you. It's really uh, part of a team um, effort from uh, everybody back in uh, Philadelphia. The outline of the talk will be a review of the techniques as we are in a sonography um, course, but I will also um, emphasize the clinical use um, of this uh, sonographic uh, procedure, especially as it relates to preterm birth, its prediction and prevention, and then symptomatic uh, women with preterm labor and PPROM, and I will also explore some use of cervical sonography at term. First of all, I want to make sure you all understand that uh, when we talk about cervical sonography, we do not talk about transabdominal sonography, but we talk about transvaginal sonography. When we first started looking at the cervix, uh, the, um, um, we used transabdominal um, ultrasound, but there are many shortcomings to this procedure, as you can see uh, in the slides. My point is that no clinical decision should be based on transabdominal ultrasound uh, alone. We should not use transabdominal ultrasound, probably even for screening, because many times we miss um, a cervix that is otherwise shortened or open by transvaginal um, ultrasound. So please, if you really want to screen for preterm birth with, with um, cervical ultrasound, don't use transabdominal. Translabial could be used, but unfortunately also has shortcomings, especially the fact that the external os, as you can see in these slides, is difficult to see, and it's so it's more difficult to obtain an adequate um, image than the standard, which is transvaginal ultrasound. The technique of transvaginal ultrasound, uh, the way I like to, um, the acronym is TVU. You can also use TVUS, which is trust your vaginal ultrasound, uh, TYUS, sorry. Um, Again, it's been around for a while, and it's really revolutionized OB-GYN um, in general. Um, as you can see in this um, slide, the um, uh, bladder um, needs to be empty. Um, the um, procedure is safe, comfortable, and well accepted by patients, and it's really easier than even translabial. So that since you have the probe so close to the cervix and you get the best image, the um, technique of transvaginal ultrasound is the gold standard. The technique is very important um, and I want to review it in uh, detail. Again, once again, before you take the patient into the room, you make sure that she empty, empties her bladder. Uh, use a condom cover probe. Uh, we usually let the patient insert such a probe. And as you can see, uh, the probe goes into anterior fornix of the cervix. And then you obtain um, a view of the uh, all length of the endocervical canal. As you can see in this picture, as I am pointing, here is the um, internal os, here's their external os. Um, you want to make sure you don't um, put too much pressure on the cervix. You enlarge the image as much as you can, um, at least two thirds of the screen, if not more. Um, and then you obtain multiple measurements. Um, in the literature, uh, it is said that uh, you should obtain at least three. Uh, use the shortest best measurement that um, gets a view of the whole cervix, and then um, repeat those three measurements after you apply transfrontal pressure for a few seconds. The total exam should uh, last at least five minutes, because over such time you may um, detect not only um, changes uh, after pressure, but also spontaneous changes. You want to make sure you standardize this technique and you do it um, the same all the time that the anterior lip of the cervix is similar to the posterior lip of the cervix, that you see the whole endocervical uh, canal, and that, again, there is no increased echogenicity. That is the technique, but why do we do transvaginal ultrasound? We do transvaginal ultrasound mostly at this point to predict preterm birth, whose incident has been increasing tremendously, at least 30% in the last 20, 25 years, and is now 12.7% in the U.S which is over half a million, over 500,000 births every year in the U.S. are delivered before 37 weeks, and about 2% below 32 weeks. Transvaginal ultrasound of cervix has been shown to be 
really the most predictive uh, test um, for preterm birth uh, because the cervix, when it's going to open, uh, begins to open at the internal um, os, um, uh, finding that you cannot detect on manual exam. So we're going to review how well transvaginal ultrasound predicts uh, preterm birth, looking at a comparison to manual exam, what you're going to measure, what is normal or abnormal, when to do it, what kind of clinical scenarios you're going to look at, and its utility. We do know from a study now done 12 years ago and replicated multiple times, then as you can see um, on the uh, left part of the slide, cervical length by manual exam does predict preterm delivery, but uh, cervical length uh, measured in the same patients by transvaginal ultrasound has a much higher uh, probability of detecting preterm uh, delivery, a much higher um, area under the curve, and a much more significant uh, p-value. You can take multiple measurements on transvaginal ultrasound, as again you can see in the slide, but cervical length, um, or the closed part of the cervix, even if there is a little bit of opening up at the internal os, is what you want to measure. So the distance from the external os to uh, the end of the closed part of the endocervical um, mucosa. As you can see here, the measurement in a normal long um, cervix is um, an inch to two, um, and um, when you're measuring a short cervix, again, you don't want to measure the whole length of the cervix, but you want to measure the length of the cervix that is staying uh, closed, as we used to call it the functional uh, length. You can also op mention um, in uh, a report the opening year funneling. We most reported as B over A plus B in terms of measurements in the slides, but that really doesn't add much to the prediction. And here you can see it in the slides, funneling in terms of um, degree of funneling is related to a higher and higher um, incidence of preterm birth. But it's so subjective, as you can see in this slide, really hard to tell what the internal loss was, um, that um, really cervical length is the accepted um, gold uh, standard. We do know, though, that the few patients that have a normal cervical length but have significant funneling have increased or an increased, and indeed an increased risk of preterm birth. Sometimes you see cervixes that are closed, and what are you going to measure? Um, you um, could measure uh, os to os, so to speak, but usually when uh, the distance um, between uh, the cervix and this imaginary direct line is more than five millimeters, we prefer to take uh, two measurements um, and add uh, those two uh, measurements together. Again, when you have a curved cervix, that usually means that it's a long cervix. If you have a short cervix, it's almost always going to be uh, straight. Uh, and so the fact that you see a curved cervix shouldn't uh, make you worry uh, too much, but it's actually a reassuring finding in terms of preterm birth. There are several pitfalls to transvaginal ultrasound. It's not a perfect technique. I wanna, I want, again, you want to make sure that uh, you avoid some of these technical and anatomic uh, pitfalls. Um, as you can see in these old uh, slides, uh, we used to not be uh, too attentive to empty the bladder, and it's very important to empty the bladder. These bladders are too full and may mask some funneling, as probably it's happening on this case on the right of the slide. So again, you want to make sure that the bladder is completely empty, and if there is any uh, fluid in the bladder, it's a little bit of a slit there, and the cervix appears to be uh, in its natural state. You don't want to put too much pressure on the probe, and you can see that by the fact that here there is the echogenicity of the anterior lip. It's excessive. Uh, this anterior lip is too white, so to speak, and it's also much thinner than the uh, non-compressed posterior lip of the cervix. You also want to make sure you see the all um, cervix and you place the calipers um, in a good position. So I really don't know and review from this case many years ago, again over a decade ago, uh, what the sonographer was measuring. You want to take the whole uh, cervix and you make sure you know where the external and internal os are and where the new um, internal os after funneling is. Again, it's very difficult to place uh, calipers when you have uh, funneling, and that's why measuring this remaining functional closed uh, cervix here is most um, 